Pokemon Emerald might just be my favorite Pokemon game of all time. People love the third generation of Pokemon in part because it just feels like the quintessential Pokemon experience and it's done so well. And a huge part of that is because Pokemon Ruby, Sapphire and Emerald feature such a strong cast of new additions to Pokemon. Look, I like Johto, but it probably isn't a stretch to say that the additions to the franchise from Johto are a bit weaker than the ones from Hoenn. But this got me thinking, what is the best Hoenn Pokemon competitively? This was a really hard video for me to make because, okay, well, okay, honestly, these videos are always harder than I think they're going to be to make because it's really hard to say, like, what is the best Pokemon and which Pokemon should even make it on the list? This video was hard in particular, though, because there are a lot of good Pokemon that I had to leave off much more than for either the Johto or the Kanto video. That being said, I have 10 Pokemon that I think are the 10 best competitively. Okay. If, if, if your favorite Pokemon is Plusle, I'm not saying the Plusle is bad as a, as a Pokemon. I'm just saying it's bad as a competitive Pokemon. You get the gist. Let's jump into this. Starting with number 10, Shedinja, not Shed Ninja, Shedinja. Okay. I'm not going through this again. Shedinja is a really cool Pokemon. Most of you probably know how it works, but just in case you don't, it's a bug and ghost type Pokemon that only can ever have one HP. This is because of its signature ability, Wonder Guard, which prevents all damage from any damaging moves that don't do super effective damage. I talked about Shedinja a fair bit in the best bug type video, and also my editor uh, told me that I had to make these videos a little shorter because I went way overboard with Johto. So I'm gonna keep this one a bit brief, but basically Shedinja is most of the time like not considered super, super good, except when really powerful legendary restricted Pokemon are legal. Basically, some really powerful restricted Pokemon like Zacian, Kyogre, Groudon, etc. are only legal in specific rule sets, and Shedinja tends to thrive within those rule sets. This is partially because Sun and Rain are the main weather conditions, and Sand and Hail will KO Shedinja in a single turn. In these formats with Groudon and Kyogre, uh, there isn't a lot of other weather to deal with Shedinja, and also a lot of the powerful restricted Pokemon just can't damage Shedinja at all. A couple examples include Xerneas, Zacian, Kyogre, but there are others as well. Basically, having a Pokemon that could be completely immune to at least one, if not both of your opponent's really powerful legendary Pokemon was a really big deal and allowed Shedinja to kind of work as this end game demon, where if you got rid of the Pokemon that could actually hit it for super effective, it didn't matter if you lost all of your other Pokemon, you would still eventually win. It is a little gimmicky and it is hard to play with because it only has one HP, but it's seen a fair bit of use over the years, so I definitely think it's one of the best Hoenn Pokemon. Coming in at number nine is one of the Pokemon that I don't actually think is very good, but because I'm trying to be unbiased here, I'm going to include it on this list. It's Pelipper. Now, what you have to understand about Pelipper is that it has awful stats, like truly, truly just embarrassing stats. Like if Pelipper showed up to its high school reunion and all it brought with it were its stats, I don't know if people would laugh at it because that would be impolite, but like it would definitely be talked about like the next day, like, oh, did you see Pelipper? Like, uh, like they're really not, they're not doing too good. Anyway, what makes Pelipper worth using is its ability Drizzle. Uh, here's a spoiler. Weather is going to be a really big discussion in this video. Actually, yeah, let's just talk about weather right now. In modern competitive Pokemon, weather is an effect that is set up that lasts for five turns. You can also reset it once it goes down, and it can be overwritten by other weather that influences the battle in some way. Rain and sun power up water and fire type uh, attacks respectively and power down the opposite, you know, fire, you get what I'm saying, right? And also activate some other abilities. And if you have weather and your opponent doesn't have weather, you just are able to kind of execute your strategy without any worry. And so it ends up being a pretty big deal in competitive Pokemon because weather and the abilities that go with them are, are pretty powerful. And so weather is always always relevant because it's just a really cool mechanic that influences the battle in a big way. Pelipper's ability sets up the rain, and there aren't that many Pokemon that can actually do this, so at times Pelipper was the only rain setter available even in the game. That was the case at the beginning of Scarlet and Violet, for example. Pelipper, because it's very frail, uh, tends to lean into a more offensive playstyle with rain. Its, its main alternative rain setter is Politoed, and Politoed is a lot more defensive and overall just, in my opinion, a better Pokemon. But Pelipper is more offensive because its secondary flying typing is really useful to hit the grass type Pokemon that resist the water type moves. It can use Tailwind to support its team, which Politoed can't do. And because it's frailer, you would actually justify a lot of the time using a Focus Sash on it, which would let you lean even more into offense because you wouldn't need to worry about your defenses. Pelipper was good early on in Sun and Moon and actually reappeared again at the beginning of Scarlet and Violet when there was no Politoed as an alternative. Sun and Moon, you had Politoed as an alternative, but you preferred to use Rain as an offensive like Waterium Z sweeper kind of composition, so it didn't make that much sense to, to run Politoed there. But recently, Pelipper actually has popped up a lot in the competitive scene. In the current format, Pelipper is actually pretty strong because it has like a really weirdly good matchup against a lot of the restricted Pokemon because it also gets the move Wide Guard, which can be used to block spread moves. And 
let's just say right now there's a lot of spread moves anyway Pelipper doesn't have the stats to really keep up with a lot of the Pokemon on this list but its combination of its typing its move pool and its ability allow it to fill a niche that has actually been valuable over the years okay coming in at number eight is a Pokemon that has recently made a resurgence but otherwise hasn't really been used since really 2012. it's Latios I talked a little bit about it in my best dragon type video but basically Latios was one of the strongest Pokemon if not the single strongest Pokemon back in the second year of black and white in 2012. basically this is before dragon type Pokemon were nerfed this is before fairy type Pokemon were introduced this is before Draco Meteor was nerfed and this is when we had access to the powerful item Dragon Gem and so Dragon Gem Draco Meteor Latios was pretty much a delete button and and it was faster than a lot of the Pokemon back then so it kind of just like centered the entire format around itself Latios being a dragon and psychic type with the immunity to ground thanks to its ability is really nice it has good offensive stats being fast and strong but it's not so frail either that it like needs to worry that much dragon was like the best type back in black and white plus Latios could support his team with the move tailwind which was valuable at like because even after you drop your special attack with Draco Meteor you could still support your team with tailwind and that was really nice it had a mega evolution it was never really used the thing is that once fairy type Pokemon were introduced and there was more like power creep Latios kind of fell off a cliff and I honestly thought we'd never see it again unless it got like another you know like mega mega evolution uh, in case that ever happens but recently Latios actually had a resurgence in the current format despite the fact that there's a lot of really powerful Pokemon because kind of similar to Pelipper actually it just happened to have a really good matchup against a lot of the top threats and so it was actually a really valuable Pokemon it helps that it now can use its signature item the soul do which used to be like so unbelievably broken that it's one of the few times that a held item was not allowed in competitive play anyway I wanted to include Latios on this list because it literally was like the Pokemon of 2012 it really completely dominated the whole year it was also good in 2013 and it also made a resurgence recently so I mean it's a Pokemon that I guess we should never count out because even though like it has some pretty major issues and it it's been power crept basically like there's so many strong Pokemon now that like comparing Latios to Fluttermane like makes it look bad which is crazy because it's a legendary Pokemon but yeah because it was so strong early and also had a resurgence later I wanted to include it on this list okay coming in at number seven is another weather related Pokemon that I've actually talked about in a couple videos so far it's Ludicolo this is one of my favorite Pokemon because I think it's like a really really well designed Pokemon and just feels very fair Ludicolo is really great against weather teams especially teams with Kyogre and Groudon because it resists both water and ground type attacks and it has the grass typing which hits both of them for super effective damage without being weak to ice or fire which are Groudon and Kyogre's primary secondary types Ludicolo like Pelipper has pretty bad stats though Ludicolo stats are a bit better than Pelipper's in addition to having nice typing though Ludicolo also works as a rain sweeper because its ability Swift Swim lets it double its speed Ludicolo is also great because it can kind of fill a couple different roles like it can just be a pure sweeper but my personal favorite set was to use it more as a hybrid like I guess sweeper but also support Pokemon it gets the move fake out which is really valuable and competitive play one of the best moves ever and until recently it got the move scald which is not only a powerful water type attack especially in the rain but it also has a pretty high chance to burn and so you could use Ludicolo and just start firing off scalds because it's tanky if it holds the assault vest it's even tankier and if you got burns it could just really quickly swing battles in your favor Ludicolo is another Pokemon that has kind of been power crept and so right now it's not doing as good especially because in the current format both Kyogre and Groudon aren't as strong as they've been in the past and so Ludicolo's value is a bit lower but it was consistently one of the best Pokemon for like many many years in 2010 it was used to stop Groudon and Kyogre in 2012 and 2013 it could be used as a rain sweeper though Kingdra was more popular 2014 was one of the best Pokemon I brought it to the world championships myself it could be used with Politoed as like a two Pokemon rain core that didn't really need that much else and it's been used consistently ever since then as well like on and off it's definitely not a Pokemon that is like currently dominating competitive play or anything but Ludicolo was consistently one of the best Pokemon for many many years listen I hate to jump in like this but I just got a call from the big boss he said that they're talking about making Pokemon Omega Ultra Turbo Omega Super Ultra Ruby and, and also Sapphire um but only if you subscribe he says that we got it we got to look at the numbers we got to make sure there's interest so if that's something that you're interested in click the button we all want it and then for sure the games will come out soon trust me dude my uncle works at Nintendo going into our number six slot I was really wrestling on whether to put Ludicolo higher or this Pokemon but in the end I actually decided to put this Pokemon higher because it is currently a lot better Torkoal Torkoal's kind of living every mediocre Pokemon's dream because it was like really bad for a long time and then Pokemon company took pity on it they said oh Torkoal you're so cute let's give you something and they gave it the ability drought and it took Torkoal from being a Pokemon that was I would say never used but Ray Rizzo brought it to the 2013 World Championships 
I, you'd have to ask him about that. Am I actually good enough to win Worlds a fourth time in a row with intentionally using something stupid? Not that I'm one to judge weird choices of the 2013 World Championships, just to be clear. But most people would never have considered using Torkoal pre-drought. And nowadays, Torkoal is like a top contender. And pretty much whenever it's legal, you should be thinking about how you have, like, what answers you have to counter it. So Torkoal is really, really slow, like really slow. What, maybe the slowest Pokemon that is ever consistently used in competitive play. And this works in its favor because it pairs really well with the attack Trick Room, which makes the slowest Pokemon move first each turn. Torkoal is pretty physically tanky, and it's not like incredibly frail on the special side, though it's not super, super good there. And its special attack stat isn't that high, but you wouldn't know it because of the way that Torkoal kind of combos its damage. Torkoal likes to use the move Eruption, which is one of the strongest moves in the game, though it has a pretty major downside. Eruption hits both targets, and it gets as strong as 150 base power, over 50% stronger than Flamethrower, but only if Torkoal's at full HP. The thing is, because this attack is fire type, it gets powered up by the strong sunlight, so you can do really mean things between uh, multiple multipliers. You can boost it further with Charcoal or Choice Specs to boost like the damage even further, and you can use Terra Fire, to, and the damage can just very quickly become absurd. There are compositions, like full compositions, many of which have won tournaments before, that are built entirely around just getting Torkoal and Trick Room with full HP, clicking Eruption a couple times, and winning the game. What's cool about Torkoal is that even though it really wants to be used as like bulky Eruption spammer, it's not the only way that people have had success with it. It's actually one of the only Pokemon that's ever been used successfully with the item Eject Pack, which forces the user to switch out once any of its stats are lowered. This works with Torkoal because if you don't want to use it as a Trick Room setter, but you instead want to use like Drought, for the sun on your team, you can lead Torkoal and use Overheat to do some damage and let Torkoal switch out. And even if they lower your stats and force Torkoal to switch out, even like though you didn't do it, it still gets Torkoal off the field. Torkoal can also be used as a support Pokemon. There was a time in Sword and Shield where it was used with like Body Press and Burning Jealousy. Burning Jealousy, which will burn any Pokemon that had their stats raised. So this was actually pretty scary for Zacian to deal with because it always was getting these attack boosts. And Body Press could be used to hit Pokemon that would otherwise counter it, like mostly Tyranitar. Body Press, of course, taking advantage of Torkoal's huge defense stat. Anyway, Torkoal's been pretty consistently good ever since uh, it got Drought. It was one of the top Pokemon in Sword and Shield. It was used in Sun and Moon. It's been good in Scarlet and Violet and had a lot of success there as well. It's a really cool Pokemon. Like Ludicolo, it feels like I would say that Torkoal feels like the upper end of what's fair. Like it is very strong, but it also has clear counterplay and you have to be really, really careful in order to kind of pull off good success with it. And so I'm personally happy that we have it, even though I don't like playing against Torkoal because it keeps KOing all my Pokemon. Coming in at number five, and this is going to be controversial, so uh, uh, please don't yell at me. I'm sorry. I, I, this is really, I think, a fair assessment, but it's not going to feel fair. Coming in at number five is Rayquaza. Rayquaza? Rayquaza. Don't know. Rayquaza is a personal favorite Pokemon of mine because it did win me the World Championships. Thank you, Rayquaza. I'm very grateful. And I guess let's address the snake in the sky before we get any further. Why is Rayquaza not higher up? The reason has to do with the thing that we were talking about with Shedinja, where certain Pokemon are only legal in restricted formats. Rayquaza is one of those Pokemon. You can only ever use it when the format allows other powerful Pokemon like Zacian, Calyrex, etc. And the thing is that even though Mega Rayquaza, I know all you single battlers are going to be telling me about things that I don't know what that means, like like anything goes or whatever it's whatever it's called, okay? The thing is that in double battles, Rayquaza has never been the best restricted Pokemon. To be clear, regular Rayquaza is actually not even up there in contention as like a good restricted Pokemon. Like at best, you can say that it's usable, but it's pretty like widely considered to be, I think mid would be putting it nicely. What we're talking about here is specifically Mega Rayquaza, which is no longer in the games. And it was only legal for two different formats in 2016 and 2019. Mega Rayquaza was very strong, but it didn't have the same like overwhelming power as some of the other restricted Pokemon. Pokemon like Groudon, Kyogre, and Xerneas could all hit multiple targets at the same time and could threaten either huge damage or just outright KOs on them. And Rayquaza's damage is concentrated in the single target. It also thrives a bit better as a physical attacker, and so you could intimidate it. And unlike Groudon, who could hit the main Intimidate user Incineroar for super effective damage, Rayquaza like, couldn't always hit the Intimidate users for um, a ton of damage. And the other thing is that Rayquaza's best move, Dragon Ascent, lowers its defenses. And so when you're not picking up big KOs or doing huge damage because of Intimidate, it feels like a bit more of a liability to use Rayquaza. That's the disclaimer. That's why it's not higher up. To be clear, Mega Rayquaza is one of the strongest Mega Evolutions and one of the strongest restricted Pokemon, period. I did win Worlds with it in 2016, but I also won the 2019 North American International Championships with it. Mega Rayquaza has a lot of stuff going for it. It has a super deep move pool, like both on the physical and special side. Its main attack is Dragon Ascent, which causes it to be able to Mega Evolve. 
by the way let's talk about this uh mega Rayquaza doesn't need a mega stone to to mega evolve it's the only mega evolution that could evolve without holding an item without giving up its item slot and so you could do stuff like focus dash mega Rayquaza uh and assault this mega Rayquaza life orb choice ban there were a lot of really scary sets it gets one of the strongest priority moves in the game extreme speed which was just very very scary very terrifying and also with these great special moves earth power icy wind overheat could use water moves on both the physical or special side i think it gets electric moves as well like it gets all these moves it also has truly absurd stats like just absolutely bonkers stats like really 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 insane some of the best stats of any pokemon ever and on top of that its ability is completely broken its base ability is good you can switch it in and temporarily disable weather effects which is a big deal when primal groudon was legal but its mega evolutions ability delta stream completely removes all other weather conditions rather than just temporarily disabling them and it turns off all weaknesses of flying type Pokemon while Mega Rayquaza is on the field what makes this ability so broken is that Mega Rayquaza's kind of clear obvious weakness is that it has a quadruple weakness to ice type attacks but with Delta Stream that quadruple weakness becomes just a, a single weakness this ability is just nuts like the fact that it not only overwrites the other primal weather effects and all other weather um but it also makes it so that not only Mega Rayquaza but other flying type Pokemon are also like not weak to their flying type weaknesses while keeping the benefits of being a flying type is just crazy when I went North American Internationals with Rayquaza I also used it alongside Celesteela which was really nice because Celesteela didn't really play like a flying type but it got a lot of the benefits from it and when you had Delta Stream on the field suddenly not being weak to electric and resisting rock that was a pretty big deal I could go on about Mega Rayquaza for a while I, I feel like I don't need to convince people that it's strong I feel like I had to do most of the work to convince people why it shouldn't be higher up but yeah I I honestly I think it's such a cool Pokemon and I would love to see it return if we ever get Mega Evolution back though that might also mean Primal Groudon and Primal Kyogre come back so maybe maybe it's better that it doesn't come back okay coming in at number four is the last Pokemon I want to talk about before the honorable mentions it's Metagross it was one of the best Pokemon back in generation five when I first started playing competitively I think it was also pretty good in generation four before I started and it's kind of always consistently been good Metagross is a steel and psychic type Pokemon with the ability clear body which prevents any of its stats from being lowered unless it lowers it itself this is a really cool ability because it just is very useful especially as a physical attacker because of the aforementioned intimidate but there's also other things as well like things that can lower your speed things that can lower your special defense your defense it's just a really really useful ability steel and psychic is good typing as well prior to pokemon x and y steel resisted ghost and dark and so being psychic and steel type meant that you weren't weak to the normal weaknesses of psychic type being bug ghost and dark and so that was really cool and you get a ton of resistances by being steel type like mega Rayquaza, metagross also has a pretty wide reaching move pool it gets really good steel type attacks like meteor mash iron head and bullet punch it also gets nice coverage moves like ice punch earthquake it gets then headbutt and psychic fangs in more recent games it gets explosion that was used a fair bit back in the day actually one of the main strategies with metagross when I first started playing was to pair it with a bulky swagger Pokemon which would double the Pokemon's attack and then confuse it and you could use this on your opponent's special attackers or if you're really feeling crazy they're physical attackers but you could also use it on your own metagross to basically double its attack stat metagross would hold the lumberry which could prevent confusion but also help if it got like burned or put to sleep and then you couldn't lower metagross's attack because of the clear body ability it was a really scary combo metagross kind of started to feel the effects of power creep especially because it kind of got nerfed a little bit going into x and y when it was no longer uh like neutral against ghost and dark with steel losing those resistances but even with that metagross still was really good in the first year of sun and moon metagross is part of a popular strategy where you would pair it with a faster bulldoze pokemon which would lower both opponents speed stats do a little bit of damage to metagross and activate the weakness policy which is kind of like the spiritual successor of the swagger lumberry because you would still double metagross's offenses but I thought this strategy was really really cool and of course what I haven't mentioned yet is that metagross got a mega evolution and it was a really good solid mega evolution it wasn't one of the like most dominant ones but it was probably consistently within the top five most used steel typing was really nice because there's always been good fairy type Pokemon around also Mega Metagross being faster than Mega Kangaskhan was a pretty big deal and resisting Mega Salamence so it had a pretty decent matchup spread across the board Metagross is another Pokemon where power creep hasn't been super kind to it and so in Scarlet and Violet it hasn't had a ton of success but I think that whenever the power level is lower again like in future generations maybe in generation 10 I think Metagross could make a resurgence and the same is also true if we ever see Mega Evolution come back it's so rare to be a Pokemon that is good across multiple different generations but Metagross has undoubtedly done it and so I think that it definitely deserves its spot near but not at the top of this list okay before we get into the big dogs like the, the big big dogs let's talk about some honorable mentions I'm gonna go through these quickly uh to not drive my nice editor geo up a wall first book one I want to talk about is I just like it's not actually one of the best Hoenn Pokemon but it was used occasionally and I want to talk about it because I'll never get another chance to uh Trap Inch 
Flygon is one of the coolest Gen 3 Pokemon. I'm not going to argue with anybody there, but it's not super good competitively. But Trap Inch was actually used at times because it has this stupidly high attack stat and its ability Arena Trap is kind of like a worse version of Shadow Tag that traps all Pokemon that are touching the ground uh, on the field. Early on in Sword and Shield, I actually had to play one in the top cut of a tournament and I eliminated it, but if I hadn't eliminated it, I mean, maybe it could have won the whole thing. A Pokemon that's really good that didn't make it onto the list is Sableye. It's just a disruption Pokemon. Priority Prankster, Will-O-Wisp is really strong. It gets a really good supporting move pool. They recently buffed it, actually, giving it more moves that it didn't have before. Sableye's stats are really bad. It's kind of like Torkoal, actually, in that getting it the ability Prankster made it a lot better, and so it is usable, but yeah, like, it's not all that good. Gardevoir. Uh, Gardevoir won the World Championships in 2014 using a Choice Scarf set alongside the Pachirisu that very famously won that year, and Mega Gardevoir was consistent a pretty good mega evolution like it won the national championships in the us in 2015 i used it to win a regional back in 2015 as well both gardevoir and mega gardevoir were used gardevoir was used as a choice carver it could also be used as a bulky pokemon occasionally it's a cool pokemon and it basically took advantage of how overpowered the fairy type is to be honest Milotic. Uh, Milotic is a personal favorite pokemon of mine and i wanted to include it on this list but it was never used like all that much it was decent also in 2015 2015 was a good year for Hoenn Pokemon actually and basically it worked as kind of this like intimidate deterrent oh I used it in 20 I think I used it to win a regional in 2018 actually now that I think about it uh, as like an anti incineroar Pokemon yeah I wonder maybe Milotic should have been on this list actually Milotic uh, there's a lot of good this is what I'm saying like there's a lot of really good Hoenn Pokemon that like I had to cut some good ones. Speaking of good ones, I had to cut Latios. I decided to represent Latios as the Lati duo. Latios was like better in more formats because it's a little bit bulkier. It got second at the World Championships in 2018, but Latios never had the peaks of Latios. Like whereas Latios dominated a format, Latios never really did. And so I decided to leave it off this list, but it's a really good Pokemon. I think the Pokemon that I felt the worst leaving off the main list and the Pokemon that I was the closest to putting on is Dusclops. With the Eviolite, Dusclops is incredibly tanky, and it's a really, really consistent Trick Room setter. The reason why it didn't make the list is that although it was really good for a couple of years, it was really kind of localized to Sword and Shield. Dusclops, like, was one of the main threats of the beginning of Sword and Shield because of how tanky it was and how, like, hard it was to stop it from using Trick Room and Pain Split. Could do consistent damage with Nightshade, could use will o -Wisp to deal with physical attackers. It was just like a really, really nightmare Pokemon. But the thing about Dusclops is that it, it really was only very good in Sword and Shield. And if it had been used at any other point in other, any other format to real success, I would have included it on the list. But I couldn't find anything with it, and I don't remember it ever being especially good because like Cresselia and Porygon 2 are pretty steep competition for Trick Room setters, to be honest. So I left it off, but it's a really good Pokemon. It dominated Sword and Shield, and I, I felt bad having to leave it off. Okay, big dog time. Coming in at number three is Salamence. Salamence is cool because similar to Metagross, actually, it's a Pokemon that was good both inside and outside of using its Mega Evolution. The non-Mega form, I would say, wasn't as good, though it was really good before I started playing back in Diamond and Pearl and Platinum and Heart Gold and Soul Silver's era. It was one of the best Pokemon there. It took a lot of advantage of the fact that Dragon was just completely broken back in the day before the introduction of the fairy type. So yeah, it was really, really good back then. Basically, Salamence has incredible stats for a non-restricted Pokemon. It has one of the best abilities in the game in Intimidate. It can be used as both a physical or a special attacker. Although its physical stats are better, Draco Meteor is a stronger move than Dragon Claw. Outrage is pretty unreliable um, for the most part, so people choose not to use it often. And it had a couple different items it could run. It could you run a damage boosting item like Life Orb or Choice Specs, but really the more popular set was often the Choice Scarf to kind of use it as the anti-dragon dragon, where you'd have Choice Scarf, Draco Meteor, Salamence, send it out, you could use it for Intimidate, click Draco Meteor, deal with like Latios or Garchomp or any other faster dragon, and then, yeah, like then you just win the Dragon War. Many teams had multiple dragons, so you wouldn't necessarily win the Dragon War, but you would be able to do something and, and threaten a lot of their Dragon-type Pokemon. Anyway, Salamence was pretty good when the power level was lower. 2017, for example, when there was no Mega Evolution and you were only able to play with like the regional decks from Alola. Uh, it was a Pokemon that was used a little bit. I brought it to the first tournament there. Could use Z-moves pretty decently as well. Was used, same thing in 2014, and in X and Y's first year, it was a pretty decent Pokemon when there weren't that many alternative, like, intimidate users but Salamence really reached its main peaks in modern competitive Pokemon as a mega evolution mega Salamence was actually able to make use of its flying typing for the first time base Salamence only gets like fly and hurricane to use flying type damage neither of which are very good but mega Salamence was able to use the aerialate ability which turns all normal type moves into flying type moves so it could use moves like double edge return and hyper voice for really big impact and it really unlocked mega salamence's potential getting also like a big stat boost on top of an already good pokemon is a big deal especially because mega salamence was often used as a mixed attacker with both its physical and special attack stats being used so whereas some mega evolution kind of get wasted stat points and the attacking stat that they don't use 
Mega Salamence didn't have this problem. Mega Salamence won Worlds twice in 2018 and 2019, and it used very different sets. In 2018, it used as like a, a bulky setup sweeper. In 2019, it was used as a support Pokemon that could do damage on both the physical and special sides. I think it's like a sleeper for one of the best Mega Evolutions ever because it kind of gets overshadowed by Pokemon like Mega Kangaskhan and Mega Gengar, but I think Mega Salamence was one of the best Mega Evolutions of, I mean, of all time, right? It was so incredibly good. The fact that Salamence was good in Generation 4 and Generation 5, Mega Salamence was good in Generation 6 and Generation 7, it's just very impressive to me because it's so hard for Pokemon to keep up over the years, especially with Power Creep, right? For a Pokemon from Generation 3 to still be making huge waves and winning the World Championships twice in Generation 7, I think that's very impressive. But enough talk about Pokemon that are good, but not legendary. There are two Pokemon on this list that you all know we're going to be here at some point. If you didn't, then I would be very surprised. And I have a confession for you. As a YouTuber, I have to say that I failed. I cannot deliver on the premise of this video. I cannot give you a top 10 list of the best Hoenn Pokemon of all time because I could not in good faith and good consciousness with my solemn duty as a YouTuber to say only things that are true, <laughs> whichever YouTuber follows without fail or exemption, I could not pick a number one and a number two. This is Breaking News with your news anchor, Joe Banana. Good evening. Our top story tonight, chaos erupted moments after Wolf Click admitted to lying to his audience. Riots have broken out in the downtown area. The stock market has completely crashed, and oh, d this just said, Wolf Glick has been arrested. Here's a photo of him being taken to the courthouse where he'll be tried by a jury of his peers. We'll keep you updated as the story develops. Groudon and Kyogre are so close, they have so many accomplishments that I could not say what, which one was better, I just couldn't do it. So. Obviously, number one and number two go to Groudon and Kyogre. It's a tie for first place. I don't know what to tell you. Let's talk about why I had these ones tied. I've been playing competitive Pokemon for a while, so my process for making these lists is often to kind of go based on gut feeling, which one, which Pokemon like feels strongest and, and assemble the list that way, and then go back and double check with results to kind of work around the tiebreakers there. When two Pokemon feel like they're very close, I typically like to go with results, especially at the World Championships as the tiebreaker. Groudon and Kyogre were both on the world's winning team in 2010. Kyogre was on the world's winning team in 2016. That was a very handsome world champion, by the way. In 2019, it was Primal Groudon who took the crown with Kyogre not being used in the finals and in 2022 neither Pokemon won the world championships so if you're counting that's one win for Groudon one win for Kyogre one win for Primal Groudon one win for Primal Kyogre on top of that both Groudon and Kyogre were like the legendary Pokemon in fact they were like the restricted Pokemon for many years that they were legal including the years where they didn't even win for example Primal Groudon dominated a play in 2016 it didn't win the world championships that year but it was on the main composition it was paired with Xerneas it was incredibly incredibly powerful in 2019, Primal Groudon was again dominating, but Primal Kyogre was really good as well. Kyogre was also used throughout that entire year, arguably to more success than Primal Groudon. And in the end, it was kind of a, a less popular composition using Primal Groudon with Lunala to win the whole thing. In 2022, Groudon dominated for a lot of the year. It was used in a composition called Rinya Sun with Zacian, but Kyogre was keeping up as well. Kyogre was one of the best Dynamax attackers at one tournament. It got second in internationals. Anyway, I guess I'll just talk about Groudon first, and then I'll talk about Kyogre. Groudon is one of the strongest restricted Pokemon of all time, period. One of the strongest legendary Pokemon of all time. It has two forms. The stronger one is Primal Groudon. Primal Groudon is basically the equivalent of Mega Groudon, except maybe even stronger than a Mega Evolution would be. It has to give up its item, but in exchange, it gets the ability Desolate Land, which creates a super-powered version of the Strong Sunlight. It also becomes a ground and fire-type Pokemon, which is a big deal because it gives it a power boost on all its fire-type moves in addition to the stat boost, and so now it doesn't rely just on its ground-type moves for damage. The weakness of Primal Groudon being ground and fire-type is that it is now quadruple weakness to water-type moves, but Desolate Land makes all water-type moves not work they evaporate in the super strong sunlight it's one of the craziest like weather condition effects of all time as if regular strong sunlight weren't bad enough it also gets a signature move called precipice blades which hits both opponents and has really high base power though the accuracy is a little bit shaky this is an insane amount of buffs on top of an already strong restricted pokemon and it also changed the way that groudon played enough that it felt like a different pokemon and also it had like a different number of weaknesses and then there's regular groudon groudon is very tanky it has really good stats both offensively and defensively it's not super fast, but it's at a nice speed tier where it can work in multiple forms of speed control as well as with no speed control. It's a pure ground type, unlike Primal Groudon's ground and fire type. 
But most importantly, its ability sets up the strong sunlight. Now, let's take a step back here and revisit some Pokemon we talked about earlier, Pelipper and Torkoal. These Pokemon were basically nobodies until they got abilities that set up the weather because their stats were so bad they couldn't really keep up. But then with these strong weather setting abilities, they were suddenly top contenders, top threats. Groudon has an ability that sets the weather up, but it doesn't have bad stats. It has incredible stats. I think that if Groudon's ability were like pressure, it would really be like a pretty mediocre Pokemon, but having drought is just so incredibly valuable because it enables not only itself uh, offensively and defensively because it weakens the water type damage that would do super effective, but it also enables your whole team. You can build a team around sun and you can use it to, like defensively to shut down opposing weather as well, like Kyogre. Groudon lost its primal form in Sword and Shield, but the thing is that it gained access to Dynamax and Groudon's lowest like stat effectively is its uh, special defense because that's the hardest one to, to buff. Asulfus Dynamax Groudon with Max Quake hitting single target damage and raising its special defense made it one of the tankiest restricted Pokemon and almost impossible possible to remove with a doubled HP pool. Groudon was not only one of the premier legendary Pokemon of the Sword and Shield, it was one of the best Dynamax attackers as well, especially because normally to reset the weather, you have to switch Groudon out. But with Dynamax, you could just launch Max Flare and regain control like that. The only thing that I will say that's bad about Groudon is that currently it's really struggling. We now actually have another Sunsetter with, I would say, better stats, though its typing is a little bit worse defensively in Coridon. The thing is, though, this with Terrestrialization, like you don't have to worry that much about your bad defensive typing. And Terrestrialization kind of has the reverse effect on Groudon, where it's not nearly as valuable on Groudon as it feels like it is in a lot of other Pokemon, in part because Ground is just really solid defensive typing. So right now it looks like Groudon might not be one of the top threats this year, but that would be the first time that we can say that ever. And I think that's pretty impressive. Now let's talk about Kyogre. I've saved Kyogre for last because it's one of my personal favorite Pokemon. It is just incredibly strong. Unlike Groudon, let's talk about regular Kyogre first because Primal Groudon and regular Groudon functionally feel like two different Pokemon, but Primal Kyogre and regular Kyogre feel very similar because they play the same way. Kyogre is a special attacker whose main attack is Water Spout. Groudon's attacks are ground type for the most part, and they don't get powered up in the strong sunlight unless it uses fire type moves, but Kyogre's moves are water type and therefore get powered up in the rain. We were talking about how strong Torkoal was earlier with Eruption. Kyogre and Primal Kyogre using Water Spout in the rain is just that on steroids. It's even more dangerous because Kyogre is so tanky naturally that it's harder to get its HP lower to reduce the power of Water Spout. Kyogre also doesn't need to rely on Water Spout. It gets the move Origin Pulse, which is a signature move, which is its equivalent of Precipice Blades. But the thing is that Precipice Blades is a ground type attack, not powered up by the sunlight, and Origin Pulse is a water type attack, powered up by the rain. Regular Kyogre can hold a number of different items. It's normally going to hold something that boosts its damage, like the Mystic Water is the most popular one, or maybe the Choice Specs or something else. It can also use the Choice Scarf for speed. Kyogre's move pool is pretty good as well. It gets moves like Ice Beam and Thunder, which hit the Grass and Water type Pokemon that resist its Water type moves, respectively. The thing is, though, that resisting Kyogre's Water type moves doesn't actually help that much unless you're like Ludicolo, because it just hits so unbelievably hard. The truth of the matter is that just having a Pokemon that can use a 150 base power move that hits both targets, that's one of the best offensive types in the game coming off a tanky Pokemon that's being boosted by the weather is just not very balanced, it turns out. Like Groudon, Kyogre can work in and out of different speed control methods. It can work with the, the Choice Scarf, it can work in Tailwind, it can work in Trick Room, it can work with no speed control just by being faster with Icy Wind. It's a very flexible Pokemon. Primal Kyogre is basically just regular Kyogre, but on steroids. Primordial C is stronger than the regular ability of Kyogre, the Drizzle ability, and the stats getting better is a pretty big deal. Primal Groudon, by the way, could be run as both a physical or a special attacker because it got Eruption, and yeah, like sometimes it would be used actually just as a special attacker, but uh, for Primal Kyogre, it's only ever a special special attacker because yeah, Water Spout is just too good to give up on. Kyogre won the World Championships in 2010. Primal Kyogre was used by your boy uh, to win in 2016. And then it was one of the top restricted Pokemon in 2019. It pairs really well with Rayquaza, especially in 2016 and 2019, because uh, water type moves don't do anything in the desolate land and Rayquaza could disable those. And also you could have both Primal Kyogre and Mega Rayquaza on the field at the same time, which just feels mean. In 2022, Kyogre was also a really good Pokemon, though it wasn't as strong as Groudon because Max Water type move was strong, but it wasn't boosting Kyogre's stats in the same way that Groudon was, which also meant it wasn't boosting Kyogre's partner's stats. And although it couldn't be intimidated, it just felt like Groudon was offering a little bit more utility than Kyogre was. Also, Kyogre was really shut down by Gastron, especially as a Dynamax attacker, whereas Groudon didn't have such an obvious counter. The current rule set also uses these restricted Pokemon, like I mentioned a couple times, and Kyogre is like of Groudon, Kyogre, Rayquaza, Kyogre is looking like the strongest of them, but it also has fallen off pretty hard compared to where it used to be, just because there's a lot of like good Pokemon that kind of mess with it right now with like Coridon and Miraidon resisting water, Terrapagos being able to turn off the rain, and it requiring a bit more support uh, than some of the other restricted Pokemon. Like both Calyrex are kind of self-sufficient, but Kyogre, you really need to either give it Tailwind or Trick Room to get it off the ground. 
So Kyogre's not looking so, so hot at the time I'm recording this. That being said, it's still an incredibly powerful Pokemon and like, and I think if you underestimate Kyogre, you're going to end up really sad. So yeah, I definitely think both Kyogre and Groudon will make a resurgence at some point in the future. And definitely if we ever get Primal Evolution, Primal Evolution, whatever it's called, back. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, I'm pretty sure you'll like the video I made on the 10 best Pokemon in all of Generation 2. People think Generation 2 is a pretty bad region, but um, having made the list, I think that you'll be surprised at how many really good Pokemon there are. You should give it a shot.